Welcome to Counterpoint, I'm Tanya Granick allen With Christmas and the holiday season approaching, I wanna take some time out to reflect on many of the charities across this country who are doing something to help those less fortunate or to help put a smile on, on children's faces this Christmas. We're gonna feature a series of charities from coast to coast who are doing just that. And I love that because many times on Counterpoint, we cover such heavy and deep topics. We're gonna to do something a little bit lighter today. And joining me to kick it off is uh, Scott Purley, the president of The Magic of Christmas, which is a charity based out of Calgary. Scott, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Please tell us, what is The Magic of Christmas? <laughs> So uh, Magic Christmas is a pretty amazing little charity. Uh, started in 1983 in Calgary by uh, a man named Bob Johnson. And he wanted to show his kids that, um, that Christmas was more about more than just about uh, you know, gifts and toys and stuff like that. But it's helping some other people and making sure they know people believe that or, you know, believe in magic of Christmas. And um, so we we uh, organize a whole bunch of elves and Santa Claus to get dressed up on Christmas Eve and they go out and visit families that um, may not be facing a, you know, a happy Christmas. And um, so we, we visit families that, you know, either for through uh, uh, financial uh, issues or, or even just, you know, just a sad time. Um, so we, we come out and visit those families. So last year we visited 800 families all on Christmas Eve. Um, <laughs> and uh, we bring toys and gifts and singing and silliness and uh, food hampers and just a little cheer. Wonderful. And I'm sure the uh, the families are delighted to have someone think of them and come and, and bring that smile. You know, obviously things are different than probably when you started in 1983. This, the COVID situation, which I'm sure last Christmas we thought, oh, we'd be done by that and things will go back to normal. Well, they clearly aren't. What kind of obstacles or or how has the Magic of Christmas charity overcome some of these obstacles that have been presented through COVID? So, uh, yeah, last year was was a challenging year. Um, my first year as president as well. So oh, wow. Trying, trying to figure out how, how do we do this? And um, we just kind of decided, you know what? Hey, COVID's happening. Let's, um, we still need to bring people some cheer. So um, we actually had some of our costume angels making... Uh, special masks for Santa Claus as well. So um, Santa and the elves would just kind of still visit uh, from the street. So more like a delivery service, but they would come and, and deliver some gifts and then kind of step back and be able to uh, to still sing some carols that singing still still carries over that two meter distance. Right. Um, and, you know, the smiles still make it past the mask. So, Wonderful. Uh, and, but it's also, it also meant we had to change how, you know, how our volunteers and how our elves kind of get together and we used to have, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 elves on a bus um, going out to, and going into people's homes. But this year, or last year and this year, it's, uh, it's, it's more about the, you know, visit d directly um, in front. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, we also now prepack our, our, uh, our, our gifts for our, our visitor, or for our families that we visit. Okay, and you mentioned the buses, and I think this is an interesting uh, and unique component of your charity. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you use, I guess, refurbished Calgary Transit buses? Not refurbished. So can we, we partner with Calgary Transit. Um, so Calgary Transit uh, is an amazing supporter of us. They donate the use of 26 buses on like full-size Calgary Transit buses. Um, on Christmas Eve, and all of the um, so the buses go out twice each um, each night. So they they go out at seven a.m. or some of them leave. The first bus leaves at seven a.m. The last bus leaves at five thirty p.m. Um, for about a six and a half hour shift, oh, wow. and uh, and so the, all of the drivers donate their time as well. And many of them now they've they've volunteered many years in a row, um, and they bring their families too. To you know they all get dressed up as elves and and, and they go out. And it's actually a really special thing. Because generally, you know, a bus won't be going along a cul-de-sac, so it it draws a, a good amount of attention. And in oh, past yeah. years, all the kids come rushing up to the bus and um, you know want to see Santa Claus, and you know even adults come out their doors and like, what what is a bus doing here on my street? Um, you know, this narrow street that <laughs> a bus should not be down. Yes. And so last year we had so much snow two days before Christmas that. Um, uh, most buses got stuck in the snow and it's amazing seeing people coming out to try and help and 
Um, okay. Just we all, unfortunately, we only have a few seconds left, but please tell, where can people go if they want more information on helping out? TheMagicOfChristmas.org. Okay, Scott, uh, thank you so much, and uh, all the best to all Santa and his elves this Christmas. Thank you very much, Tanya. Welcome back. We're continuing our coverage on special charities that are really active during the Christmas time. And now we're going to pivot from Calgary to Walkerton, Ontario, a little town in rural Ontario. And joining me is Bobby Joe Bellamy Moran, who is the head of Grow Rooted in Love Maternity Home. Bobby Joe, thank you so much for joining me. Please tell our viewers what is Grow Rooted in Love Maternity Home? So we are a residential program in Walkerton, Ontario that uh, supports young parents through their uh, pregnancy and their first year of parenting. Okay, and how many uh, women live and mothers live in your home? Uh, right now we can house two moms and two babies and we have an extended aftercare program in our community as well. Okay, and when did your organization, when did your maternity home first um, start? When did you open up your doors? Uh, we've been supporting parents in our community for about 15 years now, but uh, we've been a registered nonprofit for five years. Five years. So I can imagine, uh, you know, dozens of women come come through your doors then in that time. That's correct. And what kind, um, what, what is the typical profile of, of a young woman or, or a woman in general coming to your home? What, what, are, what are they seeking? Um, a lot of our moms do not have extended care. So sometimes they come through agencies within our community and then we help them build a community outside of our home that they will be able to um, lean on as they go through the process of raising their babies. Wonderful. And you have a special campaign on this Christmas, I understand. We do. So this is our um, fifth year as a registered nonprofit running a campaign to where um, we are able to bless our community with Christmas hamper, hampers. So we actually um, give out gift certificates. We have found that that is more effective um, for our moms. So last year we did raise $14,000 and um, we were able to bless 70 families with $200 each. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. And are these families selected because they've come through your home, the maternity home, or are they just families in need that are affiliated with your home? They're just families within need within our community and surrounding communities as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. And for what is the average stay like for a woman who's come through your maternity home? Do they stay just for the first year, maybe a few months? What is, what is a typical stay like? So they can stay through their whole pregnancy and until they're um, usually six to eight months. Once the baby is introduced to food, then we help them transition into independent living. Wonderful. And what would the options be if your home did not exist, if you did not have this, this not-for-profit home, where would these women go? Um, a lot of women are either in shelters or depending on their situation sometimes their children are apprehended um or living in hotels or couch surfing with friends so you really do that. fill a need then in your community absolutely and absolutely and uh with the, these children um uh, do, do you connect with them as they grow up through their toddler years uh, do you keep in touch with these moms um, absolutely. So sometimes our moms come back and volunteer within our program. So they're able to add that value back into the community and really speak to our mission of what we do because of where they were once in their life to where they are today. Now, I remember, you know, say a decade or two ago, there seemed to be so many maternity homes. Uh, are there still quite some, quite a plentiful amount of maternity homes where we're helping un, unwed mothers or not even just unwed mothers, but people facing a crisis pregnancy or a pregnancy alone and needing of those supports? Um, within Ontario, there was 18. However, I believe a lot of them have closed down due to lack of funding. And um, yeah, it's been a struggle. And Second stage housing right now is our biggest struggle. So Sorry, access to housing? Yes, to um, access to affordable housing after they leave our home. It's right, and that's a, a good challenge. point. So after they leave your home, is someone working with them, a caseworker to help transition? 
So we do, we start that in the home. So usually about four months in, we start to look for affordable housing. So we use all of the agencies around surrounding Walkerton. Uh, and then it's a struggle. It has been a struggle. And do most of the women come from your area or do they even come from further away? Um, So a lot of our residents so far have been local, but we have had phone calls as far as like four or five hours away. Wow. Now, if somebody watching this program wants to get involved, wants to donate, where could they go? Uh, They can go to our website. So it's uh, grow, G-R-O-W-M-H dot com. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Bobby Joe. Appreciate it. Welcome back. We're going from Ontario now to the greater Victoria area in British Columbia, where we're going to be discussing uh, the CFAX Santa's Anonymous Society charity with the executive director, Christine Hewitt. Christine, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited to understand and learn what is CFAX, Santa's Anonymous Society? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. We are a 44-year-old children's charity, uh, Christmas charity in Greater Victoria area. And this is a really unique little program because it isn't so little, actually. Uh, For the 44 years, we've been serving primarily children in need at Christmas time. However, it's become more than a children's charity since 2002, where we have special grants that help children in poverty the whole year through. So it's it's a really lovely little organization that has 400 volunteers. And that has been the big driving force behind this charity all these years, is the volunteer culture uh, and the donor culture in our community. Wonderful. And... In those 44 years, how has your organization changed? I know you mentioned that it's not just for children anymore. How have you f- practically changed? Well, we've it is it is still for children year round, but it has changed in giving so that it's not just at Christmas time. We we began to realize that you know Christmas decorations pack up and go away for the year, but poverty does not. And one in five children are growing up in British Columbia living in poverty. So our program tends to give a hand up at Christmas in, in more ways than one. Uh, we uh, purchase groceries uh, at, through our very interesting 12-hour radio thon that we have every single year called Miracle on Broad Street. And that's where we raise the money to purchase the groceries. We pack up about 3,600 bags of groceries. Wow. And then we <laughs> and then we also give a, a $75 grocery card to help with perishables and things. Now, the key to this that we found as years went by that just providing a turkey dinner wasn't what was really going to help our families. Uh, it was going to be the weeks that the children are home from school. And that's when the breakfast program and the lunch program just isn't available. And it's, you know, that's where the greatest need fell. So now we send home food that's going to help with those breakfast and lunch meals and preparations for for dinner. And, And so that's what we did with our grocery part of it. What the wishes part of it is another thing, is that every family registered with us, we speak with the parents. Our volunteers are just amazing. And they spend time speaking about what the child's interests are and something that they're really wishing for. And then we balance all of that out and the donors in our community for 44 years have gone out and bought those gifts. Oh, wow. You know, I, honestly, it warms my heart to hear you speak of your 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 initiatives because you're sort of empowering the family rather than, you know, hosting the breakfast program yourself. You're actually giving the, the means to the, the parents to say, here you are, provide for your children and, and they have that pride in doing so. So I think that is that is very beautiful. So 3,600 bags of groceries, that's a lot. And you do this all within a short period during Christmas? We sure do. It is. And again, it's with that amazing force of volunteers. Uh, there's really only two employees with our organization and the rest is it's really powered by our, our amazing volunteer managers and leads and people who really stay engaged and their way of giving back is through their time and their skills. Uh, So it it, it just becomes a a wonderful opportunity to give a hand up. And many, many after 44 years are now giving back 
Oh, wow. And that's where it all comes full circle in our community. And, and this is why it's such a treasured, unique uh, little charity. And what kind of obstacles did COVID present? And now in the second Christmas of COVID, uh, how are you overcoming that? COVID presented huge challenges where our donors were going out and purchasing all of those wishes previous to COVID. We couldn't do that. And our volunteer forces couldn't come together the same way. So like everyone else, we pivoted quite quickly and with a, a masterful webmaster created an online giving platform called the Virtual Tree of Wishes. And we're using that again this year because we, we still couldn't gather in the same way. We didn't know, you know, there was going to be toy shortages. Right. There were all these threats of things that we still needed to keep the, the part of the COVID uh, plan in place. So we have the virtual tree and then uh, we have a couple toy drop-offs as well. Wonderful. Now, in the, we only have a few seconds left. If people want to contribute or participate, where can they go? Go to seatbacksantas.com. It's, it's, uh, it's got everything there. Our website tells you everything on how you can help. And Christine, thank you so much and all the best this Christmas season. Thank you. Welcome back. We're going to pivot from British Columbia, Victoria, BC, back to Ontario, where I'm joined now in studio by Kathy Isaac, who helps run the North End Church Food Bank here in Ontario. Kathy, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your food bank. Yeah, the North End Church Food Bank began actually um, as COVID started. Um, we saw that there was a need for food, and so we began with two families. And now we've delivered food to over 400 families. 400 families. Okay, mm -hmm. and how, how does the food get prepared? Are they hampers or how, do, how does this come together? Yeah, so our clients will go online to northendchurch.ca, um, find our little food bank um, clip, and they'll um, order the food that they would like. And then we have packers who pack on Wednesday mornings, and they put all the food into boxes, and then we have another crew that comes in the afternoon and we go out and deliver it to them. Okay, so that's a very uh, interesting and potentially different model than some of the other food banks mm -hmm. in that persons, recipients on their own can go in and select virtually, I guess, so there's no yeah. COVID restrictions there, uh, virtually what they would like to eat. So that takes into consideration probably dietary concerns, um, maybe even religious dietary concerns. Yeah, absolutely. So they let us know what they would like and what they can or cannot eat. Um, sometimes we have people who, who specify that, you know, can't have any nuts or anything. So we're more careful with those for sure. Okay, that's wonderful. Now, I noticed it's North End Church. Is this a Christian charity? It is. Um, it started when our pastor, like I say, looked around when COVID started and said, look, there's a need. We need, there are people out there who need food. They can't get to the grocery stores. And during COVID, because... Um, people were afraid to get on the buses. Um, they couldn't get to the traditional um, um, food banks either. That's and, a good point. Um, and a lot of people that when we do our intake forms, we a lot of the people from our that come to us don't have a vehicle, mm -hmm. and so they're not able to get to um, an, a, either either a grocery store or to um, a food bank. So is your your goods then the food is delivered to them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We wonderful. deliver it right to them. Right to them. That's wonderful. Now, are the recipients all Christian? Do you have to be a member of the church or, or how does this oh, work? Absolutely not. We are open to anybody who goes to our website and fills out a form. So we have people from a, a variety of different backgrounds. Um, we have families. We have single people. We have elderly. Um, we have people who um, have medical issues. Um, we've just opened up um, a, a line on our food bank so that they can ask for prayer requests. And so many people that we've had recently, um, they're suffering from cancer or other debilitating um, illnesses. illnesses and are not able to get out of their house. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. With this, I know you said you started with only two recipients or two families receiving, mm -hmm. and, and it was seen as a, just this short-term thing, and now obviously it's ballooned into to many hundreds of families. And in some ways, and I, I shared this with you before we started rolling, in some ways, of course, I'm, I'm happy that you're able to serve this large mm -hmm. community, and obviously there's this need. On the other hand, however, it's sad that so many more families are needing to rely on, on food banks to, to get through day-to-day. 
Yeah, and definitely with the rise in cost of housing, um, many families are left with under a hundred dollars a month for for groceries, for um, all of the other expenses that they have to have um, right. during the month. So uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a need out there. And today we opened our site and we closed within four and a half hours when we reached our capacity for the week. Oh my goodness, my goodness. And how, where, where do you get the food? Do you just go out and buy it or do you have donations? We get a variety of different things. There's a number of different um, businesses who have um, agreed to partner with us and are providing us with cereal and um, jams and salad dressings and all kinds of things. Um, we also have farmers who have donated some things as well. Wonderful. Um, we have um, do people who donate money and of course we have our shoppers who go out and, and shop for us as well and pick up the things that we haven't been able to to get from our community donors. That's wonderful. And obviously in the Christmas season, the need is, is so great. If there are uh, persons watching our show today who mm -hmm. want to contribute, who want to look up more about your charity, about the food bank, where can they go? They can go to northendchurch.ca. We have um, a little button for the food bank. You can go and donate. Um, you can volunteer. You can sign up to volunteer. Um, we always are looking for volunteers. We have over 50 volunteers right now but, you know, can always use more. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathy, for joining me. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. So it was a feel-good day today. We're talking about a lot of good works that many, many Canadians are doing. Please donate, be generous, and have a Merry Christmas.